it comes to trade, the aim should always be to trade high quality goods and services freely. What do we mean by food security? Well, the problem is we use this phrase um, and it means all things to all people. And so we need the system to have all of those elements, strong local ties to farmers and global chains that are functioning. And healthy food is possible only from healthy soil. More than ever, it's important that we show leadership uh, as an industry and all those things I talked about in terms of the industry working together. More in tune with our soils, with our grasses, with our grazing systems, with our genetics. So the reducing stigma around mental health issues is clearly important to all of us. That's why everybody's on this session today. We are free to make coherent policy decisions based on science and evidence. And it starts today. From curiosity, creativity is born. The second on my list of why a first-gen mindset is better than a fourth. Thank you to everybody who has, voted, uh, who has been involved at every level. We're here because of you. And I can't wait to see you in person at OFC 22. Thank you for joining us. All the best. Good night and bye-bye. Welcome to the first of the Bite Size series for 2021. My name is Barbara Bray. I'm a food safety and nutrition consultant and one of the co-chairs of the Oxford Farming Conference for 2022. It's great to have you all with us. The Bite Size events are going to be taking place from now until November on the first Thursday of every month. So do please make time to join us. We're returning after the success of last year with a greater focus on a panel. Our topic and our title for the conference next year is Roots to Resilience. We chose that topic coming out of a pandemic, realizing that the importance of resilience. How can people be sustainable in their business and resilient mentally and emotionally? And we'll be exploring some of those themes today one of the things that I wanted to draw people's attention to is really about the types of farming that we have. And we were thinking about the people who are in the, what we call the squeezed middle. They're not so niche that making a profit doesn't matter and not so large that they have the ear of the prime minister, but people who have to take whatever comes in terms of policy and find a way of implementing it and may not even have a budget to hire the, the right professionals to help them do that work. There are so many challenges and many of these businesses are family farms. And I think back through my own career, I mean, I started plenty of years ago, but I started actually working with Ugandan subsistence farmers. And if you think there are issues around inheritance and land rights in the UK, that's fair a thought for Ugandan women who don't have gender parity with Ugandan men in terms of inheritance and land and property. I worked back in the UK with a farm that was run by three British brothers. They grew tomatoes and I really liked the, the structure of their business because each brother had a specific role within the business and you knew exactly what to talk to each of them about. And I almost felt like an extension of their business, even though I was buying product from them. We argued together, we laughed together, and we planned and strategized together when we looked at trends that were coming through in retail and how they might develop their farming business around it. And I also worked with a mother and son who were growing herbs in um, undercover. And that was the first experience I had of seeing the difficulties of succession planning in family farms. So a whole range of things that we're gonna address in today's topic, focusing on family farm. Now today we're joined by a couple of Nuffield Farming Scholars and I'd like to thank Nuffield Farming Scholarships for partnering with OFC on this event. It's a new focus for us in 2021 to work with some of our industry leading organisations and I'll be introducing Wynne later. 
But before we get started, I'd like to start really with a poll. So we will have a poll appear in the bottom of the screen, and I'd like you to share your thoughts on today's question, which is, what's going to secure the future of UK family farms? You've got three options, and you just want to click on one of those options as you, you think about what might be the right answer. Any answer you pick, we're not judging. We just want to hear from you what you think. And then later on, once I've introduced Wynne, we'll be looking at the results. So you've got a, a couple of minutes to decide whether it's A, diversification, B, intensification, or C, new environmental land management schemes. So whilst you do that, it just remains for me to thank our OSC sponsors for the, from the January 2021 event, who continue to make the conference viable. So thanks again to them. Now, during the course of the session today, if you'd like to ask questions, please do use the Q&A window, which um, will be visible to the speakers. And we'll be going through the questions and trying to get through as many of them as possible. Don't be shy. We're all quite resilient people. We, we think we can take any of your questions, so do feel free to ask what you'd like. So there's also a chat window, which you can use to share discussion and thoughts with the other delegates on the screen. So again, don't be shy. Please put as much information as there as you wish so we can get some really good dialogue in this session today. So I'd now like to hand over to Wynne from the Nuffield Farming Trust. Wynne, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Barbara. It's my great pleasure to say a few words here on behalf of the Nuffield Farming Scholarships Trust. The relationship between Nuffield and the Oxford Farming Conference is, of course, long-standing and positive. This probably isn't surprising, as our values and aims are so closely aligned. When William Morris, later to become Lord Nuffield, sailed from Liverpool in 1913 to see how Henry Ford was mass-producing cars in Detroit, little did he think of the resulting legacy and tradition he would eventually leave for the development and dissemination of innovative practices in food and agriculture and, of course, the development of people. I'm sure that William Morris will always be remembered for his Morris cars produced at Cowley, the distinctive orange Nuffield tractors, and most notably the UK Nuffield Scholarship, the first farming scholarship being awarded in 1947. By now, Nuffield UK are awarding around 20 scholarships every year, and just last year celebrated our thousandth scholar. We're a comparatively small charity, yet aim to support agriculture wherever and whenever we can, through a very gifted and committed small central team and a host of willing and passionate volunteers. If anyone under 45 joining us today hasn't considered applying for a Nuffield scholarship, to undertake two months travel studying a topic of your choice, then please contact us or take a look at our website. There also exists a network of Nuffield countries which constitute the global Nuffield family, which for decades has awarded scholarships in Australia, Ireland, New Zealand, Canada and France. And as Nuffield International continues to grow, more recently, scholarships have also been awarded to scholars from countries including the Netherlands, Chile, USA, Brazil and Japan. As well as researching modern, modern cutting edge and innovative farming practices, Nuffield is proud to report a long history of developing leaders in local communities and nationally on a wide range of boards, on bodies representing farmers, and of course, as directors and presenters at the Oxford Farming Conference. Similarly, the, the Oxford Farming Conference has a long-standing and prestigious history, and this year celebrated its 75th anniversary since the first conference was held in 1936. The theme for this year's conference in January being thought-provoking and current as ever, business as unusual, was held just seven days after leaving the EU and in the middle of a global pandemic, combining to totally transform life and businesses as we previously knew and understood them. May I commend and applaud the team of willing and able volunteers at the OFC for their perseverance, dedication, innovation and resilience. As previously mentioned, the values of the Oxford Farming Conference are closely aligned with Nuffields. Discovering and disseminating cutting edge practices in agriculture and food production and developing future leaders in our industry. 
Long may our partnership continue to thrive and grow. In closing, may I wish OFC all the very best with this series of web webinars constituting the Bite Size program and building upon the success of last year's pilot, and particularly this first Bite Size today, which we are proud and de delighted to be involved with. I personally look forward tremendously to today's presentations on what is a particularly pertinent topic in the current fast-changing global climate, family farming and resilience. So back to you, Barbara. Thank you very much, Wynne. And that was a great reminder of everything that Nuffield Farming stands for as well. So just before we went to win, we were looking at a poll and we wanted to know what's going to secure the future of UK family farms. Topping the list was A, diversification with a score of 42%, followed by B, sorry, followed by C, new um, environmental land management schemes, at 20% and the remaining was intensification. So we've got a great idea of how you're feeling about the topic. I think uh, those who are going to be speaking to diversification, you've got some wind behind you. So um, that's interesting to see. So I'd now like to introduce today's topic, family farms, where are the routes to resilience? And we have three great speakers to talk about their own family farming experiences. We're going to start with John Pawsey, who's a fourth generation farmer from Suffolk and is director of Shimpling Park Farms. John is a bass player and plays in a band called The Emergers. He is also a falconer. He'll be focusing on family businesses, becoming more and more diversified and offering multiple opportunities for family members, depending on their skills or preferences. John, the floor is yours. Uh, Barbara, thank you very much uh, for that and thank you for inviting me to uh, talk today. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, what our modern family farm looks like and uh, where we are now and how will it look in the future. And I think actually um, this uh, this is us 20 years ago uh, and I think actually to sort of a brief summary of where we've been over the last 20 years hopefully can be seen on this slide. And, and what I really want you to focus on is, the, is the, the plethora of figures that is down on the sort of the, the right-hand side of the screen. And uh, what you'll notice, one figure is turnover, which is related to farming activities, and the other one is oper other operating income, which is really from diversification. And what you'll notice um, is in 2005, 2006, of course, our BPS payment, then the single payment scheme, went over to our other operating income, and that was about 120,000. Uh, and I think that it's sort of best represented on this little graph here, because we all love a picture, don't we? Um, is that what you'll see is that um, our turnover uh, is uh, has had a bit of a rocky ride. The big dip in 2008, 2009 was when we uh, converted the rest of our farm to organic and took a, a lot of land out of production to build fertility. But as you can see, it's been rising steadily ever since. But also our, our other operating income has as well, which I think is going to be a focus for all of us in, in the future. And so farming and turnover is really derived from crop sales, uh, from our contract farming income. We contract farm for uh, about 950 acres for hectares, sorry, for other people, um, and uh, our livestock income as well. Um, and then when you look at our um, other operating income, that really is derived from rents, domestic and commercial, uh, grants, which is the uh, basic payment scheme and environmental schemes. We've got a few renewable projects on the farm. We sell farm machinery, specialist farm machinery to uh, people who are looking at regenerative farming systems. And also I do a bit of consultancy as well. Um, but I think that, you know, to really understand how our family farm is going to look in the future, we've got to ask ourselves some quite difficult questions. And, and this is what I've come up with in that, you know, first of all, you know, who are the best people to run our existing enterprises? Is it actually uh, family members or is it an involvement of a family member, uh, but there's somebody better out there, more experienced or just with better knowledge than we have? So uh, we shouldn't be scared of getting other people in to help us on our journey. Um, but also to sit around the table and really, you know, get to the bottom of what the aspirations of uh, the different family members that we have are and, and what are their skills? You know, where are they best placed within the business? Um, but actually, are we capable of being in business together? Are we just going to sit around the you know, kitchen table bickering the whole time and actually not going forward? Um, 
And, and again, you know, do we actually want to be in business together? And, and certainly if we look at our business, there are ways that we could sort of segregate off bits and pieces of our business, maybe the contract farming bit of the business uh, for a family member or even an employee who wants to um, just really focus on, on, on that side of the business. And also, you know, the other thing I would ask is, you know, how much farm do we actually want in the family? And this goes back to this sort of diversification question, is that, you know, are all our skills sort of, you know, directly down the farming route? Or can we look at our rural business and actually try and determine other things that we could be doing? And would they, would those sort of things uh, fit different family members or other employees on the farm? Uh, so then you have to really sort of consider what other opportunities are on, are on offer. And I, I always feel that um, as farmers, we undervalue ourselves, uh, our skills. And a farmer came to my farm um, the other day and he brought this um, picture of an article that I wrote <laughs> that he put up on his wall in his office. And he's had it up there for, for 20 years. And, uh, and it was about me saying we undervalue ourselves and farm out the jobs we're quite capable of doing. And, and I still stand by that. Um, so if we look at um, farming opportunities, um, and, and you know, this is all stuff that isn't sitting on a tractor, it's all the other things that we need within our farming businesses. And you know, all these titles down here don't necessarily uh, uh, you know, give somebody a full-time job, but, but, but um, groups of them might do. And so we've, if we've got family members or people on, on, on our existing staff who show different skills and just, you know, wanting to be on a tractor, then this is the kind of thing we need to be looking at. And I would say an enlightened agronomist is, is incredibly important now, especially as we head towards ELM schemes and we are looking at, you know, farming in ways that really look after our soil health and for wildlife as well. We do lots of trials on the farm and actually we've not particularly rigorous about it. You know, there is an opportunity for somebody to design really good tri trials farmer trials and carry them out on the farm and give us really valuable in information we all need more help in, in administration you know we are we are absolutely overburdened with it administration bookkeeping but also we're also building up a huge amount of data on the farm through sort of our combines and our tractors and are we really analyzing that properly how are we getting uh, a, a more productive operating system out of all the data that we're collecting our contract farming arrangements, you know, I put a, a contract farming arrangement massager, people just making, going, you know, somebody going around making sure that our contract farmers feel that we love them and feel that we are really delivering, uh, you know, their needs and, and their aspirations as well. And also somebody to go out and get more contract, contract farming work. We usually wait for people to come to us. We don't actually go out there and try and find them, uh, but maybe we should be doing that. And I've been making these things up, as you can see, crop polisher, livestock enhancer, but also product marketeer. You know, we sell lots to the general public, um, uh, but we should be doing more. We need to be adding value to everything that we produce on the farm. And we've got lots more of that that we can do. So that would be pretty much a full time job for um, uh, somebody who is a good marketeer. Um, and then the other income opportunities, um, you know, we're just about to go into this big Elms thing. And when you're looking at the, um, you know, the mid tier and the top tier, you know, I put down environmental designer. We need to quantify actually what we've got on our farms and uh, learn how to sort of scale that up to to really deliver, um, you know, uh, uh, um, public goods, but also looking at uh, uh, sort of I put this net zero mind. We need somebody in charge of making sure that we get to net zero by 2030 or even before. Uh, so that's tied up with a sort of environmental design as well on the farm as well. A machinery salesperson, I, I, you know, I should be getting out there selling more of the machines that we are selling at the moment, and we're being offered other machines by the same company to go out and sell. And then there's this whole question of actually getting your presence out there. If you're starting to do more direct marketing, you're really presenting uh, your farm with uh, uh, presenting products from your farm. You know, is your website up to date? You know, social media schmoozer. You know, is it all sort of coherently sort of tied in? Are you really focusing on your message, which then comes down to adding value, and then subsequently goes on to you know managing our brand. Are we? Uh, developing a Shimpling Park Farm brand in the way that we want to, is it going in the right direction? A property tickler, somebody again like, you know, the control, um, the uh, con uh, our contract farming arrangements, our tenants who we rent buildings out to, uh, that I've got some domestic and commercial tenants, 
you know, are we servicing their needs? Should we be specialising in those areas? Should we be really sort of adding more value to that, which comes down to somebody making sure that, you know, we all our assets are being looked at. Are there redundant farm buildings that we had, we've stuck at old Smythe drilling just because we just like the fact we had an old Smythe drill? It needs to get out and we need to get more people renting those buildings out. And lastly, of course, with all these things, project management. We're not necessarily all good project managers, but one of our children might be and somebody else on the farm might be as well. So they, they are just all the things that, you know, sprang into mind when I thought, actually, what are the fantastic opportunities we've got available on our farm for ourselves, but also our family members and people that uh, are connected to the business? And I think we've just got so many amazing opportunities and it's not necessarily all about farming. Thank you, John, for that great overview of your farming business. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions coming up on that topic. So please keep your questions coming in, everybody. We are pulling them all together so we can have a really good chat at the end. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Jamie McCoy. Jamie, with her partner, Diane Evans, run Gorwell Farm in West Wales. Jamie's actually quite a busy lady. I ask her about her hobbies and I think um, not being tired, it probably tops the list, but she does like to go down to the beach, which is uh, less than four miles away, but she doesn't visit it often enough. I'm quite jealous. I'd love to live near the beach, Jamie. So Jamie is going to be talking about her farm and diversification and also asset evaluation and organisation and mindset. So Jamie, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to speak today. Um, and I think some of what I will talk about follows really quite nicely on from our previous presenter, because I really believe that the modern family farm um, requires highly skilled people to run it. Um, uh, not just highly skilled, but multi-skilled people. And I think traditionally in a family farming environment, people have perhaps ended up in that career, perhaps by default. They've been born into a family farm. They felt the sense of responsibility um, and they've kind of stayed. But now I really hope that the modern family farm is becoming um, a career of choice. Um, and that people are upskilling themselves so that they are enable, able, the whole business, to thrive, not just survive. Um, because I think being invited to talk about resilience as a topic in agriculture, you sort of, you go to the dictionary and you look up what does the word resilience mean? Um, because it means different things to different people. So for some people, you know, resilience will mean a, a crop that's able to survive the drought. Um, but for me, resilience is all about um, an ability to recover quickly from the tough times. And a lot of that, I think, is mindset. Um, and mental resilience is probably one of the most important skills that people need on a modern family farm. I'm going to show you some of our um, disasters later on. Um, you know, but every day is like a roller coaster on a farm. Um, there's highs and lows, and I think it's really important to to celebrate the wins and try to enjoy the ride. Um, but business is business, so often family business, you can hear people making excuses um, for perhaps a lack of profitability or um, a lack of progression in their business, I suppose, because there are other things that you can value within a family business, whether that's flexibility. Um, when I was traveling on my Nuffield, I saw people who'd chosen to go into farming because it was a lifestyle choice. They wanted to homeschool their children, for instance, and that was the career choice that enabled them to do that. Um, so I suppose the, oh, I've lost my train now. So resilience is, I think, really related to um, mindset, attitude, um, etc. Um, and again, our previous speaker talked about what can you do with what you've got? And I think that's such a great starting point for the family farm. So um, what can you do with a stick and a piece of wire? Well, you can see in this picture in India, a stick and a piece of wire will build you an elephant fence to protect your coconut nursery. Um, now, I'm sure that most family farms have got the odd stick and wire lying around the yard. Um, 
in fact, I would make an, an assumption that probably there's lots more than a stick and wire on, on many family farms. And so I really advocate that you use what you have to make a good start. Um, so on a family business, you've got physical assets, um, you know, land buildings, a house. Um, you probably have some capital, perhaps livestock, crops, machines and vehicles. And those things can be a great starting point for a diversification or a change in direction. Um, the other asset that you've got is people. And we've talked already about recognising skills and capability and interests of different personalities on a farm. And I think in a family environment, it's really, really important to allow people to take ownership of particular elements of a business. Um, that they've got experience or particular skills, capability, um, that they can drive that part of the business. And in the introduction, Barbara, you mentioned about brothers farming alongside each other and having very specific roles on the farm. And I think that can make a really strong family business when people recognise their strengths and weaknesses and how they can complement each other for the better of a business. So when I came back from my Nuffield farming scholarship, we we sort of did this exercise on our farm at home. And I realised that, you know, we were reasonably friendly people, reasonably good communicators, um, happy to share our house. And we started doing an Airbnb um, and, you know, one thing has led to another. And then we started getting a couple of pigs so that we could serve sausages to our b, &B guests. And that sort of ended up me supplying the village with sausages. Um, so one tiny, tiny thing, which is perhaps not farming, but is made possible by the start that you have on the, the farm and the environment that you that, that you live in, um, is, is a way of sweating your assets. And my final column on the table there is about region. So, you know, for us, we've got fantastic views. We've got a pro proximity to beaches or tourist hotspots. We've got uh, local communities, we've got like a, a Welsh identity, we can acknowledge provenance. Um, and all of those things have led us to the point where we're doing some milk vending machines um, and other diversification things too. But it's all started with us thinking, what's our competitive edge? What assets do we have, particularly including the people and how can we sweat those to maximize um, what we're able to achieve with what we've got? Um, we've talked about various options for the future of the family farm and I came back from my Nuffield and I had this long list of things and everyone's list will be different. Um, so we've we've picked a couple of these um, and, you know, you have to think about what's right for you on your farm with your family and the personalities involved. Um, but it's not all plain sailing. So on day two of our fantastic new vending machine venture you'll see that we were quite literally crying over spilt milk um, we've had accidents where we've needed to go to the nhs for help um, so that's my partner after he'd uh, lost a battle with a, a machine um, Sometimes you just have to wrap up against the cold and get out there, get stuck in, get it done. If you can take your, your best mate on the ride with you, that's my dog who is definitely my best mate and the most important member of our family, I think, actually. Um, sometimes resilience is just simply about coming back fighting. And you can sometimes put on quite a good show with what you've got. So this is our pick your own pumpkin enterprise in the in the midst of COVID. So it may look a little Heath Robinson. It is just a couple of trailers parked in a field, but we had a fantastic time. We and we made something of the opportunity that we had. Um, it's not perhaps how I might have envisaged that the whole enterprise looked that year, but it's what we were able to do with what we had. So I really, really believe that the future of a family farm is quite often about mindset. It's about organisation, um, you know, recognising what assets you've got, what capabilities you've got, what skill sets you've got. Um, 
bit of time management, a bit of organisational skills and really knowing your place. And by that, I mean, knowing your farm, your land, your place within the business, your place within the family, who who's good at what and allowing people to, to thrive in, in their place. Um, so I will leave you with that. Thank you very much, Jamie, for that insight into your Nuffield Farming Scholarship and the things that your take homes that you literally brought home and implemented in your business. That's really interesting to see. So thank you for that. I move on now to another far Nuffield Farming Scholar, John Martin, who runs an award winning mixed farming business and also a biomass enterprise which produces renewable wood chip fuel to heat a neighbouring natural trust property. John has lots of interests. He likes fly, uh, traveling, but obviously he's not going anywhere at the moment. And one thing he did tell me was he took, I think it was 500 flights between 1999 and 2000. So uh, he might be doing his bit for the environment now, but it's suddenly, it's suddenly starting to look like he's got to do a lot to pay back for those flights in carbon terms, doesn't it, John? <laughs> anyway, I shall then... Um, hand over to John now to talk about succession planning for farm businesses and talk about his own family, um, son and his daughter, who are going to be part of his business. So, John, the floor is yours. Thanks, Barbara. Um, and you're making me feel very guilty about all those flights. Um, thanks for the opportunity to join everybody this afternoon. It's great to participate in this bite-sized event. As Barbara said, I uh, am from Northern Ireland. I run a, a modest 73-hectare uh, um family farm uh, on the southeast coast of uh, Northern Ireland, so about 15 miles south of Belfast. Um, we're mainly focused on, on livestock currently with uh, around 700 breeding sheep, a uh, few dairy heifers for a, a neighbouring young farmer uh, who uh, is uh, gone back into milk and I want to reduce the worm burden uh, for uh, for my, my sheep. We grow a few acres of um, spring barley for our own use and then as Barbara mentioned uh, we supply biomass to a national trust property so we've tried to you know make best use of the, the resources that we have available so picking up on the themes that uh, John and Jamie have already already mentioned. Um, I've worked at home on the family farm since um, 1989 having completed a uh, an HND or a have no degree as we called it and um, but I've been very fortunate to have participated in the, the management decisions since my return uh, to the farm from college. And I have a lot to thank my, my parents for uh, in that regard, that they were very open to involving me in, in the decision making uh, at a very early age. And as a result, then, you know, I've, I've gained in confidence and experience in terms of, of managing and running our business and became managing partner uh, around 25 years ago. I do have a younger brother and sister, uh, but I don't really remember any discussion around succession or who was going to farm um, around the, the kitchen table, if you like. My sister, she works uh, in marketing while my brother's a chartered accountant. But again, there was no pressure uh, either way on, on myself or any of my uh, siblings um, to come back to the farm or pursue other uh, careers if that's what we, we uh, chose to do. Um, I guess, uh, you know, my, my brother and sister assumed that um, as the oldest that uh, I'd probably take over the, the farm, um, but everybody was fairly relaxed about the situation. So in Northern Ireland, um, you know, all land is virtually owner occupied with no tenanted farms. Um, so they're all generally run uh, as family farming businesses. Um, of a range of sizes, um, you know, obviously um, they, some have grown over, over the years uh, and are now fairly complex and uh, well-developed uh, and diversified businesses. Um, about 100, uh, about 30% of the 1 million uh, acres of agricultural land in Northern Ireland is rented on an annual basis. Uh, and this is a, a the conacre system, it's, it's fairly unique um, in, in this part of the world. It creates um, some issues in that uh, it's very difficult to invest in um, you know, the land that you're renting because you have no guarantee that you'll have it the following year. Uh, if you improve the quality of the land, somebody else will come along and pay a higher rent. So that creates, creates all sorts of, of difficulties. We have uh, managed to, to rent um, about uh, 10 hectares adjacent to our, our own farm for the last 25 years. And that's done on a, on a verbal agreement 
and we've been told we'll have that as long as we, we want to continue to, to, to utilise it. Um, the reality is, once the, the lady who owns it uh, passes away, I suspect her children may want to cash the asset, so it may not just be as long term as the indication. So with very little land coming available uh, onto the open market and high rental values, uh, I've set about trying to, to make best use of the land and the resources that we have available, uh, picking up on the themes that, that John and Jamie have, have already identified. We've transformed our uh, sheep enterprising using maternal genetics to breed smaller, more efficient sheep, uh, as shown in the, in, the, in the photograph, hopefully there. Um, making, um, we've been using EID uh, identification uh, at birth uh, for uh, 13, 14 years. So everything is monitored all the way through, make management decisions to, to uh, improve performance based on all the information and the data that we're collecting. It's one thing to, to um, collect all this information as John outlined, but to actually do something with it is the key um, yeah. to, to make the changes that are required. Again, focusing on uh, soil fertility and grassland management has increased uh, yield. Uh, we're plate metering on a weekly basis. Uh, and then we're also, we've also adopted uh, rotational grazing. So the combination of this has increased uh, the yield of grass uh, and at the same time uh, our utilisation of forage has also uh, significantly improved. So we're now carrying more stock on the same uh, area but with less inputs and we're now involved in, in carbon auditing to, to try and uh, further identify environmental improvements. So I suppose, you know, my own personal view is that restrictions are limitations that we place on ourselves. Uh, we need to see past the barrier and try and find a workaround or a solution uh, that overcomes that uh, limitation. Um, I've, I've been open to new technology uh, and new practices uh, if they're beneficial to my business. And um, I suppose participating in on-farm research for 20 years has, in some cases, forced me to adopt some um, systems that I maybe wouldn't have voluntarily um, utilised, uh, but that uh, encouraged me to open my mind to some of the, the options that are available. I suppose on the back of all of this, I've been involved in off-farm organisations and you know those have been very useful in identifying skills that I can bring back to my own business. Uh, and I've also invested off-farm to, to spread financial risk. I certainly don't know anything and you know every day is a learning experience uh, we learn by our mistakes and, and that's key we make i make plenty of mistakes uh, every day probably and uh, but the, the main thing is to learn from those and then that will lead to the success that that uh, the next time around hopefully i suppose um that uh Next steps for our business, again, picking up on some of the themes already mentioned, the diversification that came out in the in the poll earlier, Barbara, um, you know, selling a view, we live close to the coast. Um, now, difficulty is I'm not great dealing with the public, um, but my daughter may be, um, she's involved in, in marketing. So, you know, that's something that she, she could come and be, perhaps become involved with. So, uh, you know, that there are options and we have dipped our toe in the, in the the pond of uh, direct marketing as well in terms of selling some of the, the land we, that we produce. Um, and as a farming business, I suppose we have to identify the, the strengths that everyone has uh, and can bring to the to the table, if you like. Um, and we also need to be realistic about what we can achieve um, and you know what with, with the resources that we have and that we don't overstretch ourselves. Um, that we're able to uh, to manage, but also contribute uh, positively to the, to the to the business. But we also need to consider about longevity, and and the reality is that um, you know nothing lasts forever. Um, that um, you know we're going to eventually crumble and and, and turn to dust, if you like. Um, and we need to con consider continuity within a, a family farming uh, scenario. And I realise now just how fortunate I've been that um, you know I was given the opportunity um, to uh, to take over the farm at a, at a young age. Um, and during my Nuffield uh, study, I looked at at succession, and um, you know it uh, it brought home to me that in other parts of the world there may be uh, better um, you know uh, there better systems in place. But the key thing comes down to communication, um, and everybody needs to, to be very clear what's happening. Um, 
if uh, you start discussions at, a, at an early age, then um, you know you don't have the uh, you know the awkward scenarios down the line where people don't you know get surprises uh, and, and they're um, you know really uh, not very happy with it with the outcome. Um, there are uh, ways to uh, you know to, to avoid that. Communication from an early age is a great way to uh, involve people and younger members of the family in the discussion, so everybody can express their view on what they want to do longer term. Um, <clears throat> if it's properly planned, um, whoever is you know wanting to get involved in the business can take over, uh, having uh, benefited from education and also the experience that they require, that they're not just out of their depth as soon as they, they take over the business. Mum and Dad can still be in the background, continuing to uh, provide uh, advice uh, as um, the uh, uh, you know the, the, the next generation uh, gain confidence. Then that Mum and Dad can step back uh, out of out of the way, and uh, then let the business carry on. And I suppose from our own business going forward, you know we're probably looking to address a uh, a potential succession challenge in the next you know five to ten years. Son just completed an agricultural degree, daughter uh, doing agricultural marketing um, with uh, agri-food and business. And uh, yeah, so we've, we've got some things that uh, we're going to have to, to, to sort out. We're, we're engaged in the conversations and uh, I think yeah, that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. And a couple of interesting take homes there about failure, for example, learning from failure. I think that's a piece of advice, no matter what type of industry that you're in. And also about the communication is something that I see in a lot of businesses and in families as well. So these these are really wide ranging bits of information that I think everybody can take something from. And thank you to our audience. You've all been very, very busy sending in questions. So I think my biggest challenge is scrolling through and making sure that I can pick all of them up and uh, get around as many of these as possible. I'd like to open the floor with the first question. Is there a need for support and training to fill the possible positions in farm diversification? So I think that speaks very nicely to what you just started to elaborate on. So if you could continue. Um, I would say that, you know, looking down and, and thinking about the list of things that I put up uh, uh, that would we, we need sort of extra help on as far as the farming and the diversification bit of the business is concerned, is that I do think that there are, um, there's lots of support and training out there, but, but uh, and some of those things is going to be outside the farming industry. Um, so I, I think, I don't, you know, looking at my, my list, I can't think of anything in that list that wouldn't be um, wouldn't be supported by, um, especially the children, my children's age between 22 and 18, is that they are just thinking or just starting on their, their sort of higher education. And, and, and what I feel we should be doing as a family farming business is actually presenting um, them with that list of things and giving them some kind of idea of the direction they might want to go in. Uh, to facilitate one or two of those things in the list. So, no, I think there's plenty of places that we can get training. It's really up to us to just go out and, uh, and, and find it. That's a very good point. Thank you for that. And I'll, I'll just hang on to something you've said there and come back to it later. But first, I'd like to go back to John Martin, because we have got a question around tenancy. So the question is, many tenant farmers on AHA tenancies are restricted to agricultural use only and can't diversify their businesses in the same way that owner occupiers can. Something that you talked about in your talk. So what would your advice be to them? Well, I think uh, sometimes um, it's very difficult, as I say, to, to see see the, the barrier or the or the issue. And um, perhaps you know, is there some way they can collaborate with neighbours or uh, others in the area that may uh, allow them to to you know create a, a bigger enterprise, uh, something that they can all be involved in. Obviously, it's very difficult, that, you know, because not all people are like-minded. Um, but uh, I think you know, th those are the types of things that are that are worth exploring. Not being from, you know, uh, having a lot of experience in, in tenancies, um, you know, I understand the, the difficulties um, that, that that are faced. Um, but uh, yeah, it's something that uh, you know needs a little bit of thought. I don't know if any others have any comments on that. John or Jamie, would I you like to? Yeah, sorry.
No, I, th I think there's always there, there, there are difficulties, obviously, in a, in a tensive situation. But I still believe that um, you know there's enough uh, slack in most tenancy agreements to allow you to do something uh, different. But but I accept that there are, there are difficulties. And Jamie. Yeah, nothing really further to add to that. I still think we're returning to the same point about it's about people. It's about re recognising where your opportunities are and trying to focus on the positives, perhaps rather than the limitations. Um, and I do acknowledge that sometimes you need to identify the limitations in order to help move forward with the opportunities. Um, but just to link back to the previous question um, about uh, skills and training, I think that can be really critical to helping people see what their opportunities are. And there is a plethora of training opportunities out there. There's there's a plethora um, free of charge. Um, so, you know, you can go to organisations like AHDB who have any number of training opportunities available all the time. Um, but every now and then it might be most appropriate to go outside of the industry and it might require you to actually pay for training. And I think that can sometimes be a barrier that people are reluctant to do so. Actually, I think it's really important to think about those as an investment in your future rather than as a cost to the business. When you look outside of agriculture, most people would have a training budget. Um, and regardless of cost, it's the investing the time um, because on family farms, we can be absolute busy fools sometimes running around. Um, and, you know, perhaps that back to the organisation, the, the skills required to run the business, um, sometimes a, a moment to think and a, a moment to reflect on what's needed can be a really good investment in the future. Very well said, Jamie. And whilst we're on the topic of skilling again, I just wanted to um, put out this question. So actually from AHDB saying happy to farm 24 to everybody. I totally forgot to mention that today and um, saying that John made a great point about bringing in additional skills to expand the typical family farm. But how can the industry um, appeal to those outside of agriculture looking for career change? So we've just been blessed or maybe blessed is not the right word, but we've just been given a, an opportunity of a lifetime of a whole lot of people who have been on furlough and might not have a job to go back to. So what would you say to people like that who are thinking about agriculture for the very first time, having, I don't know, had spent 20 years doing something completely different? I'll start with Joy. I, I, I think that the the thing that just brings up to my mind is the data thing. Um, and 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 getting people in to really get excited about the amount of data and the amount of trial work we're doing and bringing some rigor into that and you know that can be for, for anybody from with any sort of kind of tech background and the other thing that we can offer i see as a positive and i hope the others do as well is that um you know we can offer an amazing working environment uh, compared to some other industries and you know th there's this you know extra thing that we can offer that you know uh, we we took on a, a bookkeeper recently a part-time bookkeeper and she'd lived in a town her life and now she comes to work in this office and and she, it, you know it, incredibly excited just about, about being in the place so you know wrapping up a fantastic working environment with something uh, that sort of you know brings something really new and innovative into our industry from somebody outside our industry i think is really important and we'll learn from 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 then as well yeah thanks john in the interest of time i will just go to a different topic because i do feel that this is going to be quite interesting for everybody and this question it goes back to that whole diversification so is the emerging market for trading carbon credits a real lucrative opportunity for diversification we've got a volunteer who'd like to start with that is that anybody's particular area of interest I certainly don't declare to be a, an expert barbara but I, I think i know in some recent discussions particularly in the livestock sector it may require all of the, the sequestration that we have on our own within our own businesses to offset what we're, we're producing on the on the production side. Now, th there will be opportunities along the way, no doubt. Um, but, you know, that, that that's from, from a starting point. Uh, we have to try and find a way forward. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you that, for that, John. Jamie or John, have you got a comment to make or more reflection? 
that's fine if you have them because there are plenty more. I, 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 I'm aware of, we're being offered opportunities in this field, you know, probably weekly. And uh, my feeling is there's a lot of ends to tie up. I think there is going to be, be an opportunity. Um, but I think that, um, as I say, there, there are ends to tie up. There's two different markets at the moment that aren't necessarily talking to each other. And there's some vagaries and we just need to get that right before leaping in and uh, missing out on an opportunity. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay. Jamie. I, I will just offer a comment and I know nothing about the topic at all, but a little reflection is that sometimes the first opportunity is not necessarily the best opportunity. Um, and also that in order to diversify in, in any sense of the word diversify can often require different skills. And if you're starting out at something new, you kind of start as a novice. Um, so it, it might be that we need help and advice to understand these things before taking the plunge. And I'm no doubt there will be opportunities there for people. Um, just, I think you have to have some sort of understanding of what you're going into if it's going to become part of your family business. And, and there might be somebody else in your family who is better equipped with the knowledge to analyze that opportunity. Thank you very much for that. So what I'll now do is go around you all one last time with this last question, which is resilience can also be understanding when it is time to stop doing something. How can the, how does the industry help those who need to leave the industry and make space for new entrants? So if I could a comment from each of you on that, please, as we close, starting with John Martin. Well, I think in, in, uh, in the past we've had retirement schemes, new entrance schemes, those types of things. Currently in Northern Ireland, we have a, a system, uh, land management scheme, trying to bring uh, retiring farmers together with new entrants who maybe don't have a farm. So trying to marry the, marry the two up. So, you know, uh, that, that's that's one mechanism that, that can help. It's, it's taking time to build and has a range of um, formats, whether it's contract farming, uh, you know, share farming, uh, diff different arrangements within that. Yeah, thanks, John. And um, Jamie? Yeah, I really hope that this is a challenge that becomes less in generations to come, that family farms are able to better empower people to maintain their hobbies or continue doing things outside of the farm so that we don't get caught in an identity where our job is everything about our personalities and then that fear of stepping away from something could potentially be removed. Um, I think it's still there at the moment and we've already talked about um, the importance of having early conversations um, but I think the more that we normalise people stepping out of the industry the more um, people will feel able to do so and I've just got huge respect for people who are able to say I've done my time and I'm going to step away but equally businesses who are able to analyze you know what was working perhaps previously no longer does now is time to move on um, because actually every end is a new beginning and so I really hope that people can start to think about those things in that in that way. Thank you Jamie and finally John Pawsey. I, I don't really recognise the uh, the the difficulty for a new entrant thing. And in the, in the, think about our farming business, where you know we've got subcontractors, uh, people coming in left, right, and centre who are you know uh, young uh, um, you know male and female operators who are buying their tractors, buying a hedge cutter, doing a bit of ditching, whatever. You know the average age of uh, the people working on our farm has plummeted over the last 10 years as people get involved in farming. I think that the loss of BPS is going to uh, have a it, it potentially could have a culling effect on those who are unwilling to change and will bring opportunities to uh, new people. Uh, I think we shouldn't co uh, confuse land ownership and people actually involved in farming. I think they're two very separate things. And lastly, going back to my list of jobs that, you know, I really want to create on our farm. My feeling is that a lot of farming family businesses do have the opportunity to offer uh, different and alternative roles uh, for people in rural businesses. Thank you very much. So some comprehensive answers to today's questions and thanks to the audience. Thank you very much to Nuffield Farming Scholarships Trust and our wonderful speakers today. The recording will be shared via email so you can watch it back on demand next week. 
and I have some exciting news to share. So today we are launching the Oxford Farming Scholarship Scholar Programme for 2022, which is going to include a return of our Breaking Barriers Scholarship sponsored by McDonald's UK. So to find out more, please visit our website. We'll be adding a link to the chat. And then the other news is that our next Bite Size will take place on Thursday, the 2nd of September, and that is titled Farming on the Front Line of Climate Change. So this will be hosted in partnership with Nature Friendly Farmers Network, and you can register to join us by clicking on the link in the chat or on the on-demand email. And our speakers for the next Bite Size will include Botalatsi Musi, a farmer from South Africa, Martin Lines, a farmer in the UK and founder of the Nature Friendly Farmers Network, and Ellen Litchfield, a farmer and veterinarian from Australia. So we're going to keep the momentum going all the way through to our conference in January and have lots and lots of debate and interest. Thank you ever so much for joining us and for the wonderful questions and thanks again to the speakers. Have a lovely afternoon everyone.